started uh, the closing session. I'm going to keep it very brief, and then we have another slide presentation after our lovely keynote. So with that, I would like to introduce Gail Campmeyer. Our, she is filling in as co-author uh, for Terry, who could not be with us for this session, sadly. Um, but we were very excited to have Gail uh, able to step in. And Gail joins us as an entomologist and researcher, retired. And Gail, which group did you work on? Aphids uh, as vectors of aphids as vectors of plant viruses and also um, flies. Although I was not the taxonomist on the, that group, I worked with oh, the so databasing. Cool. So we had just finished that talk about plant pollinators, and people were asking about disease vectors as well. So that's a very cool tie-in uh, from one to the next. Mm -hmm. uh, Gail has been a longtime member of TADWIG, and she knows so much about the history of what has happened and what is happening that uh, between her and Terry, uh, tying this all together to make a lovely picture for us about where we've come from, and we're excited uh, Gail, to hear uh, from you about that. So with that, I would say, please, Gail, take it away. Okay. Well, I know that Terry, who I saw in the audience, um, is very sad not to be here in person, as, as am I, because I'm talking to you from Illinois. Um, but we're going to be talking to you about the sociological history and transforming Tadwig into biodiversity standards. <clears throat> oh. Okay. Oh no. Um, so in 1985, when Tadwig was born, um, where were you? Um, please find the uh, Slack channel and add uh, where you were at. Um, in 1985. Maybe you weren't born yet. Um, here I was outstanding in my field, um, soybean field, uh, looking for soybean mosaic virus. Terry was on vacation with her older brother and family. And in the world, um, it was also a time when people were united to spotlight hunter and the farmers who feed the world. Uh, we were looking at the past and into the future. So this first meeting in Geneva um, was with ten or nine men at the Conservatoire et Jardin Botanique, and four more sent their apologies. Um, all of these were from five countries, representing three continents, and the majority of them were from Europe. Um, they were mainly plant biologists. From that first meeting, we all we have are the minutes. Um, all the archives from 1985 to 2018 were provided by Walter Berenson. Thank you, Walter. Um, Terry did find, um, managed to contact in doing her detective work, uh, two of the original Ted Wigians, um, Dr. Ferrero, and, who is 80 and from Colombia, and um, Professor Werner Goethe, from, um, who is 84, from Germany. <clears throat> uh, Professor Goethe was instrumental in getting Tadwig in recognized as a member of the International Union of Biological Sciences. And he noted that even in the early days of uh, Tadwig, uh, this was, uh, rec they recognized the need for standards for author and literature citations. The fact that we had three birthday celebrations of sorts over the years, but no centralized place for these to be found and highlights um, highlights the need not to lose this history. Um, as people retire, they leave or otherwise cut the thread. Uh, because Tadwig's history is not just one of creating and maintaining and promoting the use of standards, but of the people who contribute to it, um, building this process, we need to know about them. So what kinds of sociological changes do we mean? Um, there's been a globalization of conference venues, uh, inclusion of greater diversity of participants by gender, um, country authorship, 
and on the executive. Um, we're focusing on this because uh, TEDWIG is an international consortium. It's driven by you. Uh, and we wanted to see how far we'd come. Terry was interested in that question also because she's part of the equity and inclusion group at her university and would like to make some progress in these fields. And she's especially interested in bias. And I've had a long interest in this topic since co-organizing co the Women and Entomology Breakfast and Diversity and Inclusion Symposia at the Entomological Society of America conferences. And we both brought our experiences to Tadwig. So what kinds of changes do we have documentation for? Uh, from the beginning, Tadwig has been an international, but the distribution of participants has been skewed to English speaking countries represented most, mostly by men. So where did we go? Uh, over the 37 year history, you can see the different countries where our annual co conferences have been hosted. Um, they've been held predominantly just over half in English speaking countries and the official language of the conference is English. Um, but the Global South, which you can see uh, defined in as the red countries or continents, excuse me, in the upper right is not well represented. So how do we involve more participants from the Global South? Is trying to hold conferences there an answer? So this is a graph showing participation sorted by gender. Since we've never really deliberately collected gender data, we apologize in advance if we've misinterpreted and assigned your gender wrongly. Things to notice here, participation by women appears either steady, viewed optimistically, or stagnant, viewed pessimistically, between 15 and 20, 30% during most years. Interestingly, uh, numbers started to reach parity on, in the online pre, uh, participation in 2020, 2021, and now in 2022. There are more women than men registered to attend virtually this year. In-person number is still stuck at about one third, but this offers some insight into how we might increase opportunities for involvement. Keep this in mind when we talk about building resilient um, networks in a few minutes. This nice colorful graph, you can see the um, participation for selected venues sorted by the regions that are represented on the Tadwig executive. Um, we see that for some regions, um, Mexico in uh, 1992, Perth, Australia in um, 2008, Beijing in 2012, Nairobi in 2015, and Sophia in-person attendance in 2022, uh, where the conference is held definitely influences participation. These regions are part of the Tadwig family, but barriers exist to travel, language, and funding to get there. Um, the problem then becomes a matter of retention. How do we keep those new participants that we engaged in Tadwig for more than a year? Uh, comparing the 2021 virtual conference distribution of participation with the 2022 online column, they are more similar than different and show an increased level of diversity of participants. There were 49 countries uh, represented in 2021 and 41 this year. So this graph even more clearly shows uh, where we hold physical conferences does matter. In 1992 in uh, Mexico and 2015 in Nairobi, over 50% of the participants were from the Global South. And it wasn't until the conference had a virtual option that there was a corresponding increase in participation from the Global South. But as 2020 shows, having that option is not enough. 2020 was free for everyone, and it was the first year of the pandemic. Privilege, in other words, access to good internet, um, ability to add a conference online, even to uh, newly upended lives, shows up in the numbers. Access is equal, but not equitable. And what do we mean by that? Um, 
So despite the free registration of um, 2020, access to the conference, um, access to adequate internet was clear, uh, certainly a barrier in some places uh, in the global south, and certainly lives became more complicated with the pandemic. The 2020 virtual conference was a step in the right direction, however, and the second year of going virtual in 2021 showed increases in participation from Africa, Asia, and South America. The virtual component of this year's hybrid conference shows that increased support in discounting re uh, registration fees for low middle income countries, students, postdocs, and early career professionals has made access to the conference more equitable as well. To become JEDIs, however, with the J for justice, while we at TEDWIG want to promote this, we cannot do this alone. Extracting data from heterogeneous sources, as we all know, is um, one of the many strengths of our friend Arturo Arino. Um, many of you may remember his 2016 talk, TEDWIG Now and Then, and he has updated some of the graphs he provided us with uh, pre-pandemic data on people as authors and recruitment and retention of participants over the years. This graph represents data from authorship from 2003 to 2019. And you can see a clear increase in uh, of women's participation as abstract authors, finally reaching 25% in uh, 2013 in Florence and definitely increasing another 10% over the next seven years. Also from Arturo's data, <clears throat> he plots generally steady rise in the scope of what he calls the Tadwig family. Um, in other words, all contributing authors on uh, abstracts from 1999 through 2017, with a slight dip in um, 2018. A joint conference with Spinach, the Society for, uh, for the Prevention or Pre Preservation of Natural History Collections, that we it was held in New Zealand. Um, Biodiversity Next in 2019 was a game changer, and it showed a quantum leap in our family size. We have more work to do to see who has been retained, however. Uh, the recruitment rate reflects a percentage of new contributing authors um, adding to Tadwig's reach. This is a knowable number, but the attrition rate also expresses a percentage here of authors in, of, in any one year are those who contribute once but are never seen again. This rate requires knowing whether the authors are seen again, so it's a little more imprecise. We also got help from uh, Pensov's uh, Theodor Georgiev, who extracted data from our uh, journals, uh, Biodiversity Information Science and Standard, or BIS, um, which started in 2017. Here you have the gender balance of authors, the statistics from, did they include here the abstracts from both Spinach and Tadwig in their joint meeting? Um, were these proportionately were these disproportionately higher because of spinach, which has a stronger history in of participation by women in natural history collections? How reflective of the gender distribution of Tadwig's membership are the proportion of authors shown here? These are things we don't know yet. So Theodore also extracted um, information on first authors by country where and where two countries are acknowledged you can you may not be able to see that very well i don't know um, authors claimed affiliations for both um, totals by year show the greatest diversity associated with biodiversity next in 2019 with 45 countries being represented um, Diversity increases when you look at all authors, but some countries still dominate these proceedings. So it goes up to 69 authors in 2019, or 69 countries, excuse me. 
So what have we learned so far? Um, we've come a long way since uh, 1985. We've been increasing participation by women, both at conferences and as authors and co-authors, and increasing participation um, by countries and regions by delegates to the conferences and as authors and co-authors of abstracts. But the pandemic has brought us an interesting uh, ripple in this. Virtual participation has broadened the reach of the Tadwig family. And for in-person conferences, location matters, particularly in the global south. But we still have work to do to become proper Jedi. So what is uh, most important and how do we get there? Again, please help us by uh, putting in your opinion of what we think, of what we should be concentrating on. Um, how, do, how do we ask or find better demographic data? There are issues of privacy. Um, what are the most important benchmarks for marking progress for next steps in gender ba balance? age stratification, in other words, recruitment of younger people into Tadwig's family, career steps, um, language diversification, uh, geographic representation, and cultural values and sensitivities. Um, the transformation has been a long one. Um, Tadwig has evolved a lot since the creation of the consortium. It started with botanists only and opened up only to other domains of biodiversity and geodiversity at the recommendation of IUBS. I was the first zoologist and entomologist to attend a conference in 1996. Uh, after a change to the website, but not the constitution, we had an uneasy decade of trying to explain what TADWIG meant uh, when it clearly did not represent the acronym for Biodiversity Information Standards. This year, uh, we finally embraced the, that the TADWIG acronym is part of our legacy, our identity, and it's not going away. Uh, it's part of our brand. And our new logo reflects that. And I hope you will take a chance if you didn't get a chance to hear Marika Peterson's presentation in uh, Contributed Oral 3 um, on Tuesday, I think. Um, please do check it out. It talks about the process of uh, that we've gone through for the new branding of Tadwig. The constitutional changes that took effect in 2017 also altered the structure of the executive committee. Previously, the chair had a three-year term and no deputy chair, making succession more difficult as well as recruitment for this top position. Having a deputy chair succeed the chair encourages and promotes a greater diversity of potential leaders. They get a little bit of on-the-job training. Changes include offset terms for um, elections. In other words, not everybody is up for election at the same time. Um, and the creation of functional subcommittees, also known as standing committees, as critical components for uh, the Tadwick executive. Reduction in the number of people elected to the attack of uh, Tadwick exec was also part of this, um, as well as I mentioned, the creation of the deputy chair to provide training and continuity. So this shows, um, that the, um, we've had up and downs in, in gender. Um, the constitutional changes for the executive committee were put into effect by, uh, during Cindy Parr's term as chair. She was the first woman to become chair from, and she was chair from 2014 to 2016. And Deb Paul is the second, and she's the current chair, as you know. Um, Ellie Wallace will be our uh, chair from 2023 to 2024, and all three of these women have English as their native language, and two of them are from the US and one from Australia. Even though Tadwig nominations are free and open, you can self-nominate, 
women haven't always been part of the executive committee. Why aren't they being nominated or volunteering for these positions? Well, when you're thinking about this, um, it can be still surprising that even in 2022, it can be so difficult for women and people from underrepresented groups to get ahead. Um, it's worse when you consider the intersectionalities such as gender and race or culture and geography. And when asked who should be the next chair of TADWIG or asked to be a, co a keynote state speaker at a next conf or a conference on committees uh, or share shaping our standards, we often think fast, okay, as this um, author is talking about. Um, thinking of our friends, people we know well, uh, fast thinking is unconscious and it's uh, the one under the sway of implicit biases, ones that we don't uh, do not control or cannot control easily. Um, and as such, it's uh, is governed not by that slow part of the brain, which is uh, this author thinks is only 2% of uh, what we do that singles that, that considers all of the angles, uh, how to get gender uh, and geographically balanced group to work together, how to make a panel of experts we put together that does not all look alike. But the fast part of our brain chooses someone like us, uh, tending to rank those we view as other if we think of them at all, as not good choices or worthy of consideration. It's important that we be aware of these differences in Tadwig because we gather scientists from different fields of expertise, developers, informaticians, biologists, ecologists, taxonomists, et cetera, and they all bring strengths to the table. So this brings us back to the Tadwig executive. Um, Tadwick has 15 elected positions, half or more of which come up for election every year, and this year is no exception. Uh, one lesson that appears over and over again in the literature and anecdotally is that people often are waiting to be asked. They're shy. They don't know that they can do the job. They feel they don't know enough and wonder what happens when others find out that they don't belong. This is also known as the imposter syndrome. This is especially true of many women and underrepresented groups in Tadwig. And so if you know of someone for whom one of these positions, uh, who should be nominated for one of these positions, please ask them if they are willing and then nominate them. So what are some of the other ways that Tadwig does promote um, equity and inclusiveness? Um, one is that we created a code of conduct. Uh, the first one was in 2018 at the New Zealand meeting, a joint meeting with spinach. Um, we also this year uh, drafted a diversity and inclusion statement. And at our annual conferences, we've discounted uh, conference registrations uh, for lots of different groups. We've waived reservations. Uh, discounted or waived registration rates for participants from developing nations and work to encourage diverse voices, uh, particularly from the global south at annual conferences. There are <clears throat> opportunities to organize symposia, workshops, panel discussions, or other events. And we've now recognized that virtual conferences um, provide an opportunity for increased participation from previously unrepresented, underrepresented groups. Tadwig is also uh, developing standards that are community driven um, and free for all to use and promote an open exchange of biodiversity information. These are all important parts of uh, promoting equity and inclusiveness, not just within Tadwig, but uh, in the world that we are contributing to. We provide webinars um, and have a YouTube channel and we promote our activities through Twitter and Facebook, Slack, GitHub, email lists, um, and our website. A new standard for um, 
collection descriptions has been named uh, after a woman for the first time. Uh, you should make sure that you uh, catch Matt Wedburn's presentation in Symposium 15. Um, and uh, it's, as I said, it's the first standard that's been named after a woman. Uh, two other standards at least have been named after men. Uh, Charles Darwin for Darwin Corps and um, John James Audubon for Audubon Corps. But we're finding that naming standards after real people is a risk. Should, can, should Tadwig continue this tradition? What are the pros and cons? Um, bicycle. Bicycle is the Biodiversity Community Integrated Knowledge Library. Uh, you probably heard a lot about it at this meeting and, and many of you will be going to uh, the one that follows. They had their first hackathon in Mize in um, earlier this year. And of the nine group, working groups, one was on hidden women in science. Uh, the goal was to improve the visibility of, of women in sciences and the output was the creation of 36 stories that were added to a huge number of stories that you can access at this URL. So they contributed to greater knowledge. Where do we still need to work? We need you to add your voice uh, and make it heard in volunteer positions. You can become part of the community to work on standards development in interest and task groups. You can join a functional subcommittee uh, as a committee member. You don't have to be the chair. You can join the committee. You can join the program committee for the conference. Um, you can organize a session at the conference, become a mentor, become a reviewer for BIS. So back to um, building resilient networks. So it's relatively easy to build a network in um, at a physical meeting. Uh, by comparison to being virtual. Virtual meetings could arrange to um, have informal meeting spaces for small groups to interact. Um, in 2021, we used Whova as a virtual meeting platform. This year, we're using uh, the 2022 Slack uh, that provides a place for interactions. Um, one of the strengths of this is uh, as Whova, is that it provides a place for both in-person um, synchronous and asynchronous virtual participants. Uh, we need to enlist uh, allies and mentors to introduce our, uh, us to new contacts um, and get comfortable maybe with meeting more online, um, having our cameras on during discussions so that we see one another face to face. Meeting virtually can engage more people in question and answer than in per, uh, in-person meetings. And the chat features allow participants to help one another. Um, and as in this meeting, um, they are often recorded for viewing at a later time. I'll end up doing that for almost everything in Tadwick 2022 because of the time zone. Um, you can also, uh, engage captioning and translations and volume regulation in these kinds of things. So we're experimenting. Um, we're making documents and uh, documentation accessible in languages other than English of controlled vocabularies of our standards, um, of documentation such as the code of conduct, and diversity and inclusion statement, which we now have both in French. Thank you, Ther Terry. <clears throat> and uh, conference pages. But those all require people volunteering to uh, translate into their native language for the benefit of others. In 2022, participants were allowed to record their presentations in their own language with subtitles and um, slides in English. We had somebody take us up on this. 
I'm really excited to go back in here uh, and test my skills in Spanish listening to Javier Molina's talk in Contributed Oral 4. Uh, please see whether you think that this is a type of experiment we want to continue. Um, online participants may uh, enable live uh, transcription and translation where available. And participants can use pre recorded presentations or live, present live online, like I'm sitting here doing now. So, take home messages. Uh, Tadwig is an open community, it's driven by all of you. And we want to know how you would make Tadwig more equitable, diverse, and inclusive. Um, please join us. Uh, for the conversations, if you'd like to be part of the change and share some of these ideas in the Slack for this talk. We'd like to thank um, a whole host of people, including the Tadwig executive, all the people who do, uh, provided data and background to us, um, and the happy birthday, Tadwig. So um, apparently in France, you have a tradition of uh, finding Maurice, où est Marie, Maurice. Um, in the US, it's where's Waldo. Uh, see if you can find, as you go through all of this, where Maurice is. And at that, I will... Um, I guess stop sharing. Thank you, Gail. Big round of applause now. <laughs> what a tour, Gail. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Gail, for that amazing retrospective, giving us a perspective on just how far we've come and some guidelines to figure out and, and engagement ideas for where to go. Um, yes, Terry, perhaps in the chat there, you can explain to us who is Maurice. <laughs> um, I have questions, but I'm sure our audience does too. So please take a moment, start putting your questions in the chat if you have them, uh, comments, questions here in the audience in person that you can think of right now. So I have, I'm going to start with one and then I'm going to, I see two hands went up. Could anybody in the room and online, you can enter uh, perhaps the role you played. Please stand up if you've been a member of the Tadwig executive in the past. If you have been a member of the Tadwig executive in the past, please stand up. And now, and present, sorry, sorry, and present. Yes, excellent. If you, uh, online, if you are a member of the Tadwig executive in the past or current, if you put your role that you played or do play in the Tadwig executive. There's Terry, secretary, treasurer, William, technical architecture group, thank you. Yep. And here in the room, I think uh, those of you online might be able to see the in-room camera. You can see, um, hi Chuck and Holly and James, and Quentin, Steve and Shelley. Um, thank you very much. Um, but again, taking the opportunity for, for leadership. Questions coming from, James, would you like to go next? You had a question? I guess I'll have a comment and then a question. I, I just want, I wanted to say thank you very much uh, that this was extremely interesting and timely. Uh, and uh, I hope that what I'd like to see is maybe we can keep some of those figures live somehow. Uh, I also really like Arturo. I use this all the time. That network diagram that he built is, is cool. And I challenge Arturo to put that up live on the web somewhere that we can constantly uh, see how those networks are growing. If you're listening, Arturo. Oh, cool. 
Please, he I is. Think you also had your hand up. Yeah. Oh, wait, one moment, Quentin. Yeah, it's just about, you know, um, we're looking forward to the next one, but it's a long way away. And I wondered if, how much uh, the exec had thought about having regional meetings or maybe the regional representatives thought about running their own meetings in their own continents, um, because it's an opportunity for many more people to go and, and that helps diversity. Gail, what do you think about regional meetings? Um, I think regional meetings could be a possibility. The problem might be um, organizing them. Um, there are lots of different things. There, are, it might be a good thing for certain kinds of regions, in particular where language can be a unifier uh like latin america where they could use either brazilian or brazilian portuguese or um spanish um over something people are more comfortable in for example um i don't know uh, it it's something I think we have considered even just finding everybody uh, for regional representatives being able to contact everyone and keep them in the loop of what's going on in their region has been a challenge for regional representatives. Um, and one they haven't exploited yet, I because I think that Stan has um, tried to sort people into MailChimp um things so that that uh, regional uh classifications but i'm not sure how successful um whether that's usable yeah so in other words we could explore perhaps a bit more i think mm -hmm. that's something spinach is the society for the preservation of natural history collections is also thinking about and has talked about before, but hasn't implemented. A mm -hmm. um, little bit of balance here. I'm trying to go back a second and navigate um, the online Slack, the online Zoom chat, and the in-room questions. It's a little bit of a dance, um, but you know I like dancing. Gail, um, you're at Poland asked, did you consider analyzing independent versus institutional attendees? Independent meaning what exactly, Joran? Jorat. By uh, independent, I mean uh, folks that are you know operating independently, so not 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 associated with an institution. Exactly. Ah, okay. Um, that would be an interesting kind of of demographic. Um, what do you think that we're going to find with it? Harder to get to a conference. Well, personally, as an uh, independent, I uh, I don't have a giant travel budget, even mm. like paying for registration is sort of like, mm, um, yeah, yeah, I go or am I not going to go? That's why I hesitated to the last moment to actually join. So, as a retiree, I am part of that camp too. <laughs> So we have another question I'm trying to figure out, I think from Nikki in the Slack and Nikki, you may have to clarify later, but I will read it. It's often noted that the balance between core research and quote unquote service is skewed for women and ethnic minorities. For example, those with privilege get to spend more time on activities that advance their careers. Nikki writes, in my organization, when we employed an EDI, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Officer, and recently set up staff networks with volunteer coordinators, almost all the network chairs were women. Is it possible to research this research, research this research service balance uh, with Tadwick data? So what role are women playing? Are they, play, are they playing research roles or service roles? Nikki, I think I paraphrased that correctly, I hope. Perry, you want to take that? 
you need to unmute. Yeah, I don't know if my voice is <laughs> very. I'm um, sorry. I'm I'm very sick and unwell. And thanks so much for stepping up and and did this presentation for for both of us. Gail, it was very very nice and very cool. Um, so if I'm looking at Tadwick um, demographics, most of the times, yes, women are uh, doing the organizations. We have, though we have more um, convenience for interest group and task groups, so that's a very good thing. But it's also something that we have to uh, analyze as well. This is part of the thing I wanted to do, but didn't have time to, to do it. But yeah, I think we, we will see a quite different balance. Does it answer your question, Nikki? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, so, so answer us in the chat. I believe we can see it up on the front of the screen. Yes. Um, thank you for that. And, and we're sorry you're unwell, of course, but we're glad you can still step in. Yeah, I would have liked uh, to be there with you all, but. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, so yes, Nikki says, thank you, Terry. It's something that we definitely need to be aware of. Um, there are several people in this room with whom I had that very conversation. Um, just because women step up to play a role in organization and, and service, it's often the role that they're offered. It's the role that they're sort of given to step into, whereas the research role is one they might be playing a role in or facilitating, in, but they are not necessarily recognized for that or invited to a seat at that table. Um, are there other questions for Gail and for Terry coming up now in your brains? You've heard a little bit of this, yes? Ah, Chuck, thank you. Chuck, who's here in the room, writes, do we have the history of the Tadwig chairs since 1985? Was that on one of your slides, kinda? I mean, it was the whole executive, right? It wasn't, or was it just by chair? We do have one slide. You do. Yeah. Yeah. So, Chuck, did you want to follow up on what? Why did you want to know? Or there was definitely. Hang on. Huh? Sorry. Yeah. I just the, we gave the the history of the locations of the meetings. You know, so we're doing this sort of uh, look back. So I thought, oh, wait a minute. What about, uh, you know, who was the chair of Tadwig in 1985? Uh, some interesting uh, people uh, served in that role for those years of 85, 80s and 90s. So be interesting. So are you saying, well, the, the history of chairs, they did. There have been three women chairs. The rest were men. But you're saying on the committees, you're saying on the, I got it. No, we didn't make a list of the, but yeah, but we just, right. Uh, but they did a bar graph showing that that was men and then just three women. Right, right. Got it. Got it. You want the names. Got it. I believe, Terry, you and Gail would have the names, right, of the chairs over the years, the chairs that were we, all the names of each chair. Um, I think we can get at them. I don't know um, whether we have them all, actually. Uh, some of the very early minutes are quite spotty. Um, yeah. And... Um, I was going back through the history with Stan and got to, I think, 19, to Jim Croft, as far back as Jim Croft, because Jim Croft, after Jim Croft was Stan and um, I think then Walter Berenson, um, I don't have it in front of me, but yeah. um, Chuck, you were in there in 2013. 2012, 2013. These were when we had three year, um, three year uh, stints for chairs and for all of the, all of the um, elections. Um, 
So it wasn't until 2017 that we started two year rotations of things. So um, there's a lot of data out there and there's a lot of holes. <laughs> and, and I think Arthur's helping. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Gail, go ahead. So, go yeah. Ahead. Um, we ran out of time. There was just, yeah. there was a lot of stuff to put together and um, we're scratching the surface and we'd like to keep this going. Yeah. So with that, Gail, I think that's a great place for a round of applause and thank you for all the work that you both did. Thank you. And for giving us a lot to think about and a lot to act on and hopefully some motivation to take on some roles and put your hand up and help nominate other people and give them the courage to do this. Um, and with that, it's time to move on to our closing session.